Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his top 25 games of interest for 2017. This is something that I do at the beginning of the year, by the way. Happy New Year. Uh, fingers crossed this is going to be a good year. Get it get any worse than last year? Yes, but we're not going to go into that today. We're just here to talk about games. 25 of them, to be exact. 25 games that seem very, very cool to me. And you can follow along on um, this list. Right here, my 2017 Games of Interest Geek List, which is something I'm going to keep up and constantly update every month throughout the entire year. So if you have a Board Game Geek account, just go on ahead and subscribe. Every time I find something that I think is cool, then um, you'll get instant notification of it, and, uh, and I'll explain why. So this is just a resource I keep up to date over the course of the game. Although, bear in mind, like always, you got to remember, I only am interested in games that I work well with two. I am only interested in games that really kind of downplay the player conflict and play up the depth and complexity. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a very narrow perspective. There's a whole bunch of amazing games for 2017, I'm sure, that are going to come out that I will not give the time of day to because of my own personal preferences. But if you share those preferences, maybe you'll find this of interest. Now, um, I'm ready to go, although if I were to scroll down this page just a little bit, you'd see what my number one is, and I'm trying to do a countdown from 25 to 21. So, look away from the screen for just a moment while I scroll down as fast as I can. Don't peek. Don't spoil it. Spoilers. Oh, no. And okay, we're down at the bottom. All righty. Are you ready then? Let's get going with number 25, Anachrony. Now, I actually did a run-through of this game uh, last year. So I had a prototype for it while I was on Kickstarter. This is a really, really cool game. You can check out my run-through to learn more. But basically, it's a worker placement game set in a far-flung post-apocalypse future um, where time travel has been discovered. And what's happening is our future selves, far off in the future, are sending back resources that we need today so that we can build the time machine that we will use in the future to send stuff back to us. Which is right off the bat, kind of a mind-exploding kind of thing right there. And the whole game is about that. It's a very, very cool thing. Um, and if the subject matter weren't cool enough, this really neat implementation of time travel, the game itself is beautiful. And if you backed on Kickstarter at a certain level, it comes with these really awesome-looking miniatures that are just uh, stellar. Anyway, Jen and I, we had a lot of fun playing with this. It's a worker placement game where you have different workers who have different strengths, and so you want to send them to different places, and sometimes you can do instant actions, but sometimes you have to do actions that you have to commit a lot of time and other resources to supplement. There's a lot going on. It's a very big, rich campaign. Physically huge. It takes up a ton of table real estate, but we really enjoyed it. So it is definitely starting out my 25, at number 25, Anachrony. Now let's move on to 24. Lisboa, um, which I've also done a run through for. That's going to be a common refrain throughout here because, of course, I've already played a lot of the games of 2017 and 2016 when they were on Kickstarter. Same is true for Lisboa. So go check out my run through. Suffice to say, this is Vita Lasarda's big, heavy Euro of the Year. It's all about the rebuilding of Lisbon after this absolutely insane period in history where they suffered, you know, uh, the worst his uh, earthquake and in, in Portuguese history, followed by the worst floods, followed by the worst fire, all within the space of a week or two. And the city was flattened, but the government and entrepreneurs came in to try to rebuild everything, and that's what we're doing in the game. The game itself is incredibly rich, incredibly complex, but the whole thing is driven by a very simple card playing system that we really liked. And the only thing we didn't like about this game was it really didn't feel like there was that much setup variability. The game, for the most part, was always going to be set up kind of the same. So I was really keen to see that one of the stretch goals, which is, when this is on Kickstarter, and that's why I love Kickstarter, stretch goals, they got more money than they would have been able to afford to put things in in the first place. They can make the game bigger and better if they get more money up front, you know, to support a bolder and... Um, more broad-reaching design, they were able to add a feature that uh, gives, I forget exactly what it is, but some kind of new setup variability that I think will go a long way towards um, really addressing Jensen and my only complaint about the game. So I can't wait to see how that worked, because like you, I haven't experienced it. But anyway, it's my number 24, Lisboa from Designer Vila Sarda. Then on to number 23, Unlock! Exclamation point. So unlock! And here's the deal. So, escape rooms are very, very popular. They're this ridiculous worldwide phenomenon. They've gone from zero to hero. They're, they're popping up everywhere. I did a, a uh, escape room once. 
two years ago now um, in Texas. And honestly, I had a pretty bad experience. I was not very impressed at all. And you know, escape rooms aren't cheap, so I've always been kind of loath to go try one again. But you know, I love the idea in theory. I love the idea of working cooperatively with somebody. I'd particularly love to work cooperatively with my wife, Jen, and um, you know, race against the clock to solve a series of puzzles to achieve a common goal. That sounds awesome. But um, you know, I, I, and you know, actually, there are actually escape rooms here in Malta. The I think it's the sixth smallest country in the world. We have like two different escape room companies here. It's crazy. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I love the idea of it, but I also love the idea of staying at home and playing board games with Jen. So, uh, last year, there was a big explosion of escape room style board games where you can recreate an escape room experience in your own home. But it seems like almost all of them are, have requirements of three players at least, or are designed for families, so they're a little bit on the simple side. Or, I mean, there's actually one other series, but it's only available in German, and nobody knows it's ever going to come out in English. So, I've been kind of lying on the sidelines saying, man, I wish there was something for me and Jen to play, and I think Unlock is going to be it. It's uh, going to be a series of escape rooms, and I really like the system they're using, where, I mean, effectively, in that Unlock box is, I think, just a deck of cards with some rules for how you go through the cards. Um, I'm excited to try this out, and uh, anyways, maybe I'll get brave again and go and try another escape room in real life. I mean, like I said, they're right here in Malta. I should give it a go. But in the meantime, I'm excited to try Unlock. From Space Cowboys, the same uh, publisher that brought us Time Stories, which has worked out to be a very, very wonderful uh, experience. So I'm hoping for something similar from Unlock. Now, let's move on to number 22. Keeper! All right, Richard Breeze goes back to the Keedom, where he's made so many wonderful games, most importantly Key Flower, which is my top 10 games of all time. And so, this is his big yearly Keedom game. And what's interesting about this is it's a worker placement game. There's some really neat stuff about the worker placements where if I place a worker in a place, you can kind of follow in my footsteps and use that same area if we kind of have this synergy between players, um, which, which sounds very, very cool. Um, and also, there's kind of like this two-phase. All my workers do one thing, then they get to do a different thing, which kind of reminds me of one of my favorite elements of Lords of Waterdeep. But what's even cooler is the notion that the board itself, I mean, all boards and board games are foldable, but that's just to fold and put them back in the box. This game board is foldable in different configurations to create a different worker placement space. I really love the idea of that. So, uh, anyway, and I've been a big fan of what Richard Breeze has done in the past in the, the Key series. So, number 22, Keeper. Then on to number 21, Haven. Now, this is from designer Alf Siegert and artist Ryan Lockett. And, uh, you know, Ryan Lockett just makes beautiful, beautiful art. He's got to be one of the top... Oh. Art's so subjective. I can't say if he's you know one of the best artists working in board games, but he's certainly one of my favorites. I'd say he's in my top three. I just find his art style so evocative and inviting and warm and charming. I just absolutely love it. So just the fact that he's on the artist on this game draws me in. But then he's working with Alf Siegert, and the two of them have worked together in the past on Dingo's Dreams, which I've done a run through for, and that was an excellent, excellent game. But I've enjoyed several of Alf's other games in the past, like Fantastica. And, um, oh, uh, Trollhalla. Hey, yo, and, uh, oh, oh, what's the, the, the one where you're rolling dice that's a museum game? Maybe, uh, Cubist. Uh, you know, and, and, and several others. I mean, so I've really enjoyed Al's designs. I love Ryan's art. And then on top of all that, I love the theme. This is a two-player only game, a battle of wits, which is only something Jen and I are not huge on. But I'm intrigued by this because one player takes on the role of nature, kind of the spirit of nature, trying to keep things alive and growing. And the other player takes on the role of uh, urbanization and, and industrialization and mechanization. You know, mechanization. And so there's these two different sides, and of course they're going to conflict over the land itself. That is implicitly um, in evocative and inviting as a theme. So this game sounds really phenomenal on all cylinders. I'm very excited for number 21, Haven. Then on to number 20, um, Anduin City in the West from Golden Age Games designer uh, Eli Goldstein. And the reason I'm stoked about this is because this is basically a re-implementation of City Council, which I know is not the, I mean, you know, 
I, I guess it's kind of a, it's a Marmite game. Some people, like me and Jen, absolutely love it. Some people didn't enjoy it at all. But what was interesting about that game was it was a semi-cooperative game where all members were, all players were members of the same city council who had to vote on resolutions to decide how the city was going to expand. And everybody had their own lobbyists and they had their own secret agenda they were trying to do while all working together to make sure the city itself didn't collapse into crime and pollution. I think the core game is great. I've done a run through for it. I've, um, I think I did a follow up run through too, maybe. Uh, but anyway, uh, we absolutely love the basics. And so now, uh, Eli is going back, revisiting that design and giving it an overhaul and setting it in a fantasy universe. The, uh, the city is now Anduin, which sounds like straight out of Tolkien, some kind of elvish city. And again, the players are on the city council, all working together to try to make sure this city advances. And I assume you're not necessarily um, trying to deal with the problems of pollution. You're probably trying to deal with the problems of rampaging orcs. So, right off the bat, Jen and I love the gameplay there, but we certainly are, find the notion of a fantasy SimCities inspired game really, really cool too. So, I am very, very stoked for this, particularly because another thing that's interesting, I'm not sure how this works, but but where City Council was a uh, semi-cooperative game, this is supposedly a purely cooperative game. Oh yeah, that's right. City Council had a little mini expansion. I did a run through for that that turned it into a full co-op game. So I guess it's building on that notion and making this co-op from the get-go. Maybe that's going to make people, maybe people just didn't like the semi-cooperative nature because they didn't like the negotiation in the original. So maybe this is going to work better. I don't know. Long story short, I'm excited because it's number 20. Anduin's first city of the West. Then, on to number 19, Pioneer Days. Now, this is from one of the designers of Elysium. I should have written down which one it is here. I didn't, and I've totally forgotten. Sorry about that. But, um, this is basically... Does anybody remember the old classic computer game, Oregon Trail? Um, where pretty much every single time everybody died of dysentery or cannibalism or whatever? I have to admit, I don't. I've never actually played the thing, but I've heard about it all my life. I had a TI 994. I did not have a Commodore like all the, or an Apple like all the cool kids. My parents listened to Bill Cobsey and got me my Texas Instruments 994A where um, Oregon Trail was not there. But finally, I will get to see what everybody's talking about because the ideas of it have been brought over into um, board game form. And the whole thing is run by dice drafting. And dice drafting, if you remember my top 10 gameplay mechanisms, my number one gameplay mechanism. So I love the notion of, hey, we're rolling dice, we're grabbing the dice that determines what our little pioneer group is going to do from turn to turn. Is there heading west, young man or young woman? Um, but the dice that we don't claim start to stockpile and build up towards some big calamitous event that's going to destroy everybody, potentially. Kind of sounds like Polyphony's disasters, which Jen and I absolutely love. And, um, you know, Elysium was phenomenal, so I'm interested because of the designer pedigree, I'm interested because of the theme, I'm interested because of the gameplay mechanisms. Once again, number 19, Pioneer Days, uh, firing on cylinders. Want to check this one out. And let's move on to number 18, Tribes. I actually got to see a prototype. I didn't play, but I got to sit down with the designer and look at a prototype of this at Essen Spiel in 2016. And I just got to say, I liked what I saw. It's effectively a spiritual prequel to Nations. Nations, of course, is a big civilization building game from the year of antiquity up to modern day. It's a great game. I've done run through four in the past. It's, it's in my top 10 games of all time. Absolutely love it. This is the game that is set in prehistory, at the dawn of man, you know, uh, you know as we start to basically become uh, the human society and civilization that we know today. And um, so, you know, I, I love the notion that it's just kind of building on the story that Nations already tells. But more importantly, there were a couple of things that I saw in this prototype that were very attractive to me. One is the notion that it's a civilization game, and like many civilization games, the whole thing centers around a tech tree. As you make choices and work your way up a tech tree and get different breakthroughs and advancements and, um, and all that, I mean, that's kind of standard. But here's the thing. This is a modular tech tree. Every time you play, it's not set in stone. It's going to be randomly generated from a whole bunch of different. So in one game, the wheel might lead to um, speech. And in another game, fire might lead to um, animal domestication or whatever it might be. But um, every time you play, you're not just going to kind of get into the rut of doing the same stuff. Okay, well, I'm going to do the, the wheel fire language route. I mean, because it's going to make you push you in different directions every time. I love that. I haven't seen that before. A randomly generated tech tree. That's a cool idea in of itself. But then the other thing that I really like about this game is, while Small World is certainly, or Vinci before, it is not a game I'm going to play a lot because it has a lot of player versus player conflict, 
Uh, I have actually played it a lot in the past, um, which is a whole other story I'll talk about in a podcast someday. And I absolutely loved the core mechanism of that game, which is there's a, there's a row of things that players can take. They're all good. Some are better than others. They're not all created equal. And if I take, on my turn, if I grab the third thing in this row, um, items number one and two that got skipped over, they slowly become more powerful over time so that eventually, even if they weren't very good, they become so attractive somebody's going to take them. You've seen this in other games, like uh, Friends is a really good example of this too. I love that. It is such a wonderful mechanism, and it's in tribes. So that plus random tech tree plus prequel to nations from the same designers nations? Uh, yes please, number 18, tribes. Now on to number 17, near and far. Another one that I have done a run through for. So you can uh, go check that out. This is a very, very cool game. This is Ryan Lockett's latest expansion to the Lockettverse. This is basically a sequel to Islebound, which was a sequel to Above and Below. If Above and Below, you were building your own little society above and below grand, uh, above and below land, now um, that the society has been built and it's become this wonderful city-state, you are going to travel near and far and go all over the world having adventures, you know, um, you know, enc having encounters all over the place. Still a big book of little stories snippets, but near and far takes the lessons that Ryan, as a designer, learned uh, from making Above and Below and really builds on it in a lot of very, very cool ways. More so than anything else is the fact that this is a game that can actually be played as a campaign. You can play it, I think it was over 10 stories where, you know, over time we expand and explore more and more of the world and our character we play, whether we win or lose in any given scenario, all the stuff he's learned and accumulated, you carry on into the next game. I love that. I want to see more of that in Euros. And um, from what I saw when I did the prototype for Near and Far, it looked really, really cool. I can't wait to see the final uh, product. I mean, never mind the fact, of course, once again, Ryan's art is absolutely beautiful. It comes with a storybook. It comes with a map book that you actually play on. This atlas where every time you play, you turn to a different page, and that's going to be a different world you're going to explore. This game looks really phenomenal. It is a really smart game, too. I'm a little bit nervous because um, it is a bit area control, so there's a little bit of confrontation between players, but there's so much going in here I like. I mean, well, obviously, because I made it my number 17, near and far. Now, let's move on to number 16, Museum. Ooh, okay. Um, full disclosure, I know almost nothing about this game. I really don't. Uh, it, it, uh, players are curators of a museum trying to make the best, most successful museum that will have the best exhibits and draw the most crowds. That's a subject matter we've seen in several different games before. And in all honesty, it's one that works. I, you know, I, I, t I tend to find it a very enticing, attractive one. It just, it just slots into Euro-style gameplay mechanisms so much. So um, I'm always up for another one. You know, I mean, we enjoyed Pergamon. We enjoyed... Um, uh, uh, Makarnos? Is that right? But anyway, the, I'll be honest, the reason I'm excited about Museum is not so much the design, not so much the theme, it's the artist, Vincent Dutra. Vincent Dutre? Vincent Dutra? Oh man, I knew and now I've forgotten how to say his name again. Um, you know, I was talking earlier about uh, Ryan being in my top three artists, uh, so is Vincent. Vincent's probably my number one if I ever do a top ten artist countdown. Uh, I mean, there's just, I mean, and that's not to say there aren't hundreds of insanely talented artists working in board games, but there's just something about Vincent's art. It's so bright and so colorful, and um, I mean, gosh, it's oversaturated. It just, it just exudes joy and life and warmth, and it's just so delightful. And I suspect from the art I've seen of this game, this is going to be his most beautiful game he's ever done. Because, you know, the, the notion of making a museum and Vincent Dutra doing all this different art for all these archaeological things, for all these people who work in the museum, I, I bet you it's going to be his most beautiful game ever. That's why I'm excited. I'm excited for the art of this game. And I'm sure the gameplay will be fun too. But anyway, that's number 16. Museum. And now on to number 15, Pyramids. Okay. I mentioned earlier one of the designers of Elysium um, was working on Pioneer Days, but both of them, the design duo, and man, why didn't I write down their names? I'm so sorry, I don't remember your guys' names. I think it was like Brett and some. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, the designers of Elysium, which was, is um, in my top 20 games of all time, it was like the second best game, uh, my number two, the year it came out. Absolutely phenomenal game. Love it to pieces. And so that design duo, are fine. They, they each individually published some other games since Elysium or working with other people, but now they're back together. The Elysium design duo is back. All right, I got to look it up. This is ridiculous not to be able to say their names. Oh, 
Come on. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all about the prep, aren't I? It's absolutely ridiculous, folks. I'm sorry. Let's see if... Um, and it is... Uh, Matthew Dustin and Brett J. Gilbert. I got it right. It was Brett and Matthew. I was thinking Brett and Michael. But anyway, um, so Brett and Matt are back together again, working on pyramids. And, and hey, by the way, look here. Here's a post from Matt himself. Um, I, I, by the way, if you subscribe to this geek list and follow it over the course here, one of the things that's actually really cool about it, often you will find the designers themselves who are working on these games posting about them here. Um, so, I mean, it's one of the cool things about uh, running this geek list every year. But anyway, so, I admit, I don't know anything about this game. We're building pyramids. I don't care. It's Matt and Brett working together again. And, you know, it's interesting. Matt did jump in here saying, glad you're looking forward to it. Just a heads up. Uh, this is a much simpler family-style game than Elysium. Hope you and Jen still enjoy it. The, gort wor the artwork is gorgeous. So that's interesting. You know what? I might have to move this down a couple of notches. I, it's, you know, no, it's still going to be my top 25. But seeing this which I hadn't seen before. You can see, I mean, it's red. I haven't actually seen this note um, from Matt. Hmm. And still, I don't care. So maybe it's a bit, you know what? We, we enjoy gateway games too, if the good ones. So uh, I look forward to it, but maybe this gets knocked down to number 17. I'm not sure. Think about it later, but regardless, um, currently at this moment in time anyway, number 15 is Pyramids. On to number 14, The Walking Dead No Sanctuary. Another game that I did a run through for last year. And um, this was really interesting. Uh, you know, when I did the prototype for it, I was really nervous trying to get Jen to sit down and play the thing because she hates zombies. Well, she's okay with cartoony zombies, like in um, um, Escape Zombie City or Eaten by Zombies. She's okay with silly cartoony zombies, but real ones, serious ones, gross ones, it's just an instant turnoff for her. She's just not interested. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's active, repe it's gen repellent. And so I knew this was going to be a problem because, hey, I mean, The Walking Dead, just about as serious a treatment of zombies as you can get. I mean, they are gross, they're scary, etc., etc. Actually, that's not true. They're not scary. True fans of The Walking Dead understand the show is not about scary zombies. It's about the people that are struck in this world. And so, that's why I love the show. And um, it's why I think Jen would love the show if she could get past the zombies, but she can't. But anyway, so we sat down to play the prototype, and we played through it, and here's the deal. This game is brilliant in its design. I absolutely love the fact that this is a zombie game that, like I just said, isn't all about the zombies, it's about the people. Because it's a fully cooperative game, one player is the leader. At the beginning of every round, that leader player has to play a card that is kind of gives an order to everybody, saying, okay, everybody, here's how we should behave. And it's basically like a color code. It's like cautious, um, or reckless, or kind of a neutral in between. And so you, you kind of set the tone for what everybody should be doing this turn, and then everybody has to play their own card. The thing is, when the leader says, here's the tone we're going to do, the leader doesn't get to know what everybody else has in their hands, doesn't know what they're capable of. So, once the leader sets the tone, because he has certain things that only he knows, um, because he's the one who, ha who, you know, as the leader, he's the one who has to deal with, uh, you know, the, the, the overall events that are happening. But anyway, so everybody else around, they've all got their own card of hand, hand of cards, they're trying to think what they're going to do with their different cards, the cards are all multiple to use. There's a lot of interesting uh, card play to be had. But once the leader sets the, the, uh, the objective, everybody else has to decide, what am I going to play? I really want to play this green card, this aggressive, or, you know, this, uh, I, I forget if they were red, green, blue, but whatever. I'm, you know, this aggressive card. But he says we should be cautious. Do I literally ignore his order and play the card that is best for me? Or do I listen to his order? That in and of itself is such a cool moment that so emulates the reality of a tense, tough survival situation where people don't all have perfect knowledge, perfect information, because of course everybody's focusing on their own stuff. It's a brilliant gameplay system. So, back to Jen. Here's the deal. I, I wasn't surprised. She didn't like the zombies, but she loved this gameplay so much so that she later, that same day after we had played it, asked, hey, can we play that again? I never would expect that in a million years. That's why it's my number 14. That's why I was really blown away by it. It's so... Well, first of all, as a fan of the show, it so captures the spirit of the show. It so understands the show. But even if you're not a fan of the show and you're just a fan of really cool, innovative, and unique cooperative gameplay experiences, you might want to check out Walking Dead No Sanctuary. All righty. On to number 13. Oh, this looks so cool. This was actually supposed to come out at Essen 2016. I was really bummed it didn't show up. I don't even know if it was there as a... Uh, as a demo, because uh, I was so busy I didn't have time to seek it out. But I'm still excited about it. It's a cooperative pirate defend your... Everybody's on the same crew defending a pirate ship from oncoming attacks. 
you can kind of get a sense for it. The picture. There's our pirate ship, and you know there's different battle stations. You can get on the, you know that. You, you can be steering the ship, or you can man the cannons on the side. You can go up into the crow's nest, and wherever you go, that gives you a certain action you can do. And everybody has to work together because this is a real time game where real time stuff is coming at you. But here's the thing: if you look closely at that picture, you will notice everybody's player piece is an hourglass. Once I occupy my battle station, the hourglass starts ticking. It takes that long before I can complete my objective. I love I love that idea. It is such a. I, Jen is going to love it too. It's a really, really cool gimmick. It's a nice. I've seen other games that do this. Well, actually, I don't know if I've seen any of them come out. I remember seeing another game um, that I think never did come out. But anyway, I'm excited about this. We love pirates. We never get to play pirate games for the most part. As I mentioned, when I did my top 10 pirate games earlier this year because most of them are very cutthroat. I would love to have another pirate game where Jen and I work together. I love real time cooperative games. And I love this idea of my piece is an hourglass. That is very cool and stuff. Oh, yeah, it's, it, there was a space game. I can't think of the name of it now that um, everybody was an hourglass as well. Oh. If, um, if I remember it, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen somewhere. But anyway. That's not here nor there, because right now we're talking about number uh, the 25 of 17 so far, and number 13 of those was Admiral of the Black. Then, on to number 12, the Seventh Continent. I really should have worked this around so it could be my number 7, but I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you folks, it's my number 12. Um, and the reason for that is, well, one, it's a... Uh, well, you can see my run-through of it. Once again, I did a run-through for it when it was on Kickstarter last year. I had the prototype gen. I really enjoyed it. A really great cooperative storytelling exercise um, that was so full of really, really clever ways that you could play. And probably the thing that excited me more about the game than anything else is the game tells a huge, sprawling story of exploration across that you, you explore this island by um, putting these little uh, four by four, you know, these little square. T cards out that represent all the different places on the island, and you move from one place to the next to the next. If you were to lay all the cards out for the entire island, they wouldn't fit on two tables. This island is so huge. And the reality of the way this game works is you wouldn't be able to explore this entire island and finish the whole story in one setting unless you were willing to do it for like 20 hours or something crazy like that. So the game has this awesome video game inspired built in save system where you take all the cards and you um, do some jiggery pokery with them so that you can save your progress and then later on, in a few days, you can pick up where you left off, just like a video game. Uh, it's really cool. I really, I, I rated that very, very highly. This isn't higher because, in all honesty, my one worry was the game is by it's 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 designed as a solo game first and foremost, and they've added cooperative rules. When Jen and I played the prototype, they were still working on tweaking the cooperative rules, so I never actually I didn't get to experience the final. And while they were okay, I almost kind of got the impression that yeah, we were playing cooperative, but this still kind of feels like a solo game. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the final tweaks to those cooperative rules because I loved everything about this game. I'm very very excited. It had a really great look. Again, you can check out the run through to see more. That's number twelve, the Seventh Continent. Uh, then on to number eleven, CO2, the second edition. And now, you know, I did a run through for CO2 years ago, and uh, you know, Jen, and I absolutely loved it. I still think it is the best semi-cooperative game ever. Certainly, the best one I've ever played uh, because it treats semi-cooperative in a completely different way than pretty much any other game out there. I've ranted about this, or raved about this, I should say, many times in the past, so I won't do it again. Um, but. I recently sold my copy of CO2 that I've had forever because the second edition is coming out. I've only got room on my shelf for one, and I'm excited. What will designer Vito Lasarda do coming back to his baby? You know, one of his first big designs. I think it was his, I think he did Vinios first and CO2 second. I, I, I believe that's correct. I could be wrong. And you know, last year he revisited Vinios and gave it the uh, this big makeover, totally new art style, and um, some really interesting in streamlining and improvements to the core formula. So I got rid of my old copy of Vinos so I could get that new copy of Vinos. Oh, hello, it's right over there. And uh, now I've gotten rid of my old copy of CO2 to see what v Vidal does to um, improve upon what was already one of Jen's and my favorite games. So it's my number 11. The only reason it's not higher is because we've already played CO2 so much. And so my, my, my top 10 are ones that are going to be a little bit more new to me, but still. Absolutely phenomenal. It's our favorite VTOL game to date, so I only expect this is going to make it better. Number 11, CO2, second edition. And now, folks, you've been very patient. Let's move on to the top 10. You know what? Let's come back to that in a second because 
I am so thirsty. I have been talking now for 29 minutes nonstop. I need a drink of water so bad. So, uh, hold on everybody, we'll be right back. I am back. And hey everybody, Jen says hi. Okay, let's move on to number 10. <laughs> um, alrighty, what do we got here? Ah, Crusaders, thy will be done. I actually remember hearing about this game years ago. This is something that designer Seth Jaffe, who is a designer on Eminent Domain, which is one of the best deck builders on the market. Absolutely love Eminent Domain. And um, this is a game that, like I said, he's just been working on the back burner. I mean, he, he's like the lead developer for Tasty Mistral Games, so he kind of oversees and shepherds the development of all the game designs that they put out. But this is his baby that he's been working on for years now, testing and tweaking and uh, toying with and whatnot, and it's finally going to come out this year. And, I mean, I have to admit, I was interested just because of Eminent Domain and because Seth is a really sharp guy, and pretty much all the designs that come out of Tasty Minstrel Games are phenomenal, and that's in large part due to Seth's shepherding of the design process. So if he's going to sit down and design another game after Eminent Domain, hey, I'm interested. That's reason enough to be in the top 10. But then on top of that, when I find out what this game does, forget about it. My head explodes. This is a, well, it's, you know, set in the time of the Crusades. I guess we're Knights Templars, I mean, based on the box cover art right there, that I don't know. But what I'm interested in about is, this is a um, Moncala game, where everybody has their own Moncala, which if you ever watched my run-through of Trajan, is absolutely phenomenal. Heck, Trajan is in Jen's top tens of all game, t games of all time, because she loves that Moncala so much. Moncalas are phenomenal game uh, design structures to build on. I mean because they've been around for centuries. I mean, they're just hugely popular because they work so well. But here's the thing. This is a game where everybody has their own Moncala, and over the course of the game, you customize your Moncala. You change the different spokes on it so they will do different functions. That is hella cool. I am very stoked for every reason in the book for my number 10, Crusaders, Thy Will Be Done. And then moving on to number 9, Flatline. I said it right here, that's all there is to say. A sequel to The Excellent Fuse? Yes, please. I don't know what else there is. I'm a, I, I, when I saw this the other day, I didn't even look to see if it was designed by Kane Klenko. I bet it is. Let's take a look at that really quick. Kane, are you on this one? Uh, I'm sure he must be. Yep, there he is, Kane Klenko. That's all I need to know, because if you've watched my run through a fuse, you know Jen and I adore that game. So, taking that game, um, you know, the core idea of real-time dice drafting, but building on it, making it, I mean, it's a, it's a new subject matter now. I mean, based on that box cover, I assume it's still in the same science fiction universe, but before where we were defusing bombs, now we must, it looks like we're working in a triage center trying to keep people alive. That's even cooler! I love that theme! I, I love the idea of working cooperatively against the clock to save people. I love dice drafting, I love fuse, I love flatline! At least I assume I will, I don't know. I gotta wait until we get to play it, but it's my number nine, flatline. Now, on to number eight, uh, Dice Forge. Ooh, this looks so cool. Now, this is from the designer of Seasons, and he's done a few other games that are pretty well, although Seasons is the only one I played. Seasons, Jen and I, I did a run-through for it a few years ago. We were very impressed by it. It was very, very wonderful, smart design. Really liked it a lot, but it had a little bit too much player versus player for our tastes. But still, I very much appreciated the design. Um, fast forward to now, he is back and he is bringing his Dice Forge. And what is a Dice Forge? That is a game where you take your die and you forge it over the course of the game. You have all these different die faces that you can snap onto the different faces of your dice and roll them every turn to determine what actions you're going to take. So if you want to really focus on a particular action, program, you know, or, you know, adjust or forge that die to really be heavy on that action. I love that idea so much. I mean, that it's, this isn't the first game to do it. A game called Rattlebones from Rio Grande Games came out a little while ago. It, did this, it was the first to really do this. But, although actually I think maybe there's some LEGO games that do it as well. Now that I think about it, they came out a while ago. But, I mean, all that stuff was very light, family fair. Since this is from the designer of Seasons, I'm expecting this to be a gamer's game. I'm expecting it to be gorgeous, based on this art here. And I am very, very excited about being able to forge my own dice in Dice Forge. That's why it's my number eight. Uh, I bet you Jen's going to love that gimmick. I bet you she's going to be head over heels in love with it. Let's move on to number seven, though. Myth, a dark frontier. Now, some people might be surprised by this. If you ever saw my run-through for Myth, you know it was... One of my most uh, ranty, ranterson run-throughs I ever did. I mean, there were definitely a lot of problems. 
that I articulated with the original myth, and it kind of made me miserable to play that game. But that wasn't the fault of the design of myth. Myth's design as a cooperative dungeon crawl with a really brilliant action-driven card system, or a card-driven action system, was just phenomenal. Absolutely wonderful. That game basically captured the feel of Gauntlet or similar, you know, hordes of bad guys and, you know, heroes fighting them all off. It was brilliant, but it was just marred by rushed production, you know, it, rules that were incomplete and or vague and misleading and just a bunch of weird little things. Um, so, what I mostly remember from that dark time of trying to learn how to play Myth, and I, by the way, I've got the Myth 2.0 rules. Folks, you need to thumb those Myth 2.0 rules so they'll climb to the top of request.rado.com because I want to give it a try, but there's always something else at the top of my request list. But anyway, so um, long story short, I respected the heck out of the design of that game, and now the designers are back making a sequel set in the same universe, but this is not a cooperative dungeon crawl. This is now a cooperative city defense game, you know, a castle defense, tower defense style game. And um, so, considering how gorgeous Myth was, I assume this is going to be a gorgeous game too. Haven't seen much. I'm sure we'll find out more when it goes on Kickstarter. Presumably it'll go on Kickstarter. But I expect it'll be gorgeous. I expect the design will be brilliant. I ex and um, I hope that the developers have um, you know gotten better at their job and they and they will put out a more complete final product. I mean, I want to give I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I mean, I have no particular reason to doubt that they won't have become better rules writers. So I'm excited about this across the board because of the pedigree of the design of the original game. Because I know it's going to be a wonderfully produced game. Fingers crossed that the rules will be good. But of all that aside, I'm really enamored by the notion of the, uh, the, the, the way this gameplay is described. Here's the notion. It's a programming game where um, every round there's going to be uh, morning, noon, and night. There's going to be three phases. And each player, as part of setup, they will play. You have a handful of cards, and the, everybody's car, deck of cards is unique to them because you're whether you're a fighter or a rogue or a wizard or whatever, so you have different powers. And we are all going to, at the same time, program an action for the morning, the noon, and the night. And um, meanwhile, the bad guys who are attacking will have uh, action cards that they, I think, randomly program into morning, noon, and night. So we're working out, trying to figure out, okay, um, oh, this, that's what the bad guys are going to do in the morning. That's what they're going to do at night. Okay, I'll, I'll be sure to do this defend thing. You can do this uh, support thing, whatever. We work out how it's all going to work. We program our stuff. Then we take the bad guys' morning cards, my morning cards, and your morning cards, shuffle them all together. Do the same for the for the new and the night cards, and now we see how well the, that day plays out. Did my card come up before the bad guys? Did your card come up before mine? Because we made these plans. If it works out the way we hoped, that's going to be awesome. But if the card shuffle doesn't go our way, it could be disaster. Now, I don't know. I haven't played it. But that sounds like a brilliant, brilliant system, and I cannot wait to give it a go. That's why I'm very, very stoked for number seven, Myth Dark Frontier. And then moving on to number six. Mm. Dungeon Alliance. By the way, um, there's a lot of fantasy games. T 2017 is really looking like a um, fantasy lover's dream year. I mean, I'm not done yet. There's several more fantasy games coming. There's also, by the way, a heck of a lot of cooperative games on this list. So this is, 2017 is going to be a cooperative fantasy lover's year. It's going to be awesome. But anyway, number six. Hey, it's another cooperative fantasy adventure game. Dungeon Alliance from Andrew Parks. Uh, he's self-publishing it. I believe it's going to be going on Kickstarter. Last time he did this, gave us Canterbury, which was an excellent, excellent Euro game. So, uh, again, the pedigree gives me um, hope that the gameplay will be nice. The art that's been released looks really, really sharp. But again, what I'm excited about, like Myth Dark Frontier before this, like Dice Forge before that, is the promise of the central gameplay mechanism. Here's what it is here. It's a deck building game. But as part of setup, in most deck building games, in almost all deck building games, you get your deck, you, start, you get your starting hand of cards, that's it. In this game, to build your deck, you create your dungeon party first. I'm going to take two fighters and a wizard. And so you get some cards for fighter number one, fighter number two, and the wizard. You take all those cards that represent everything your three characters can do going in this dungeon. You shuffle them all up. That's your starting deck. And then you draw your hand of presumably five cards and see what those people can do. That's awesome. I love that idea. And then, of course... As you play and you work cooperatively, I'm sure you'll get to deck build and add more stuff, save people, add them to your deck so they can add extra benefits and whatnot. 
It sounds cool. It sounds super duper cool. I love fantasy. I love cooperation. Uh, so far, I've really been impressed by Andrew Parks as a designer. That's why it's my number six, Dungeon Alliance. On to number five. Number five. Hey, look at this. More fantasy. Uh, the founders of Gloomhaven. And uh, this is from designer Isaac Childress, who I've already done run-throughs for his game Forge War and his game Gloomhaven. Um, and this is actually kind of a sequel to Gloomhaven because it's set in the same world. Gloomhaven is further up on the list. So we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, spoiler alert, Gloomhaven is coming out in 2017, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I imagine he will be putting Founders of Gloomhaven, the sequel to Gloomhaven, on Kickstarter. And heck, hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll actually come out in, before the year is out. But I'm very excited about the idea of this. It is a competitive game where um, the city of Gloomhaven is open to all of us, and we're trying to make our fortunes in this city. And um, the thing is, I mean, there's a lot of games like that, but uh, as we go through our Euro machinations of collecting resources and converting them into other resources so we can use them in our engines to score points and all that kind of Euro-y goodness that Jen and I absolutely love, what was very exciting about this, what the promise of this is from reading the description on Board Game Week, that's all I have to go on at this point, is the notion, the, the description says that um, the city is so big that no one player can get can bring into the city all the resources that are necessary to get anything done. So what this sounds like to me is a game that I've been hoping for for years. I've often said if I were to ever design a Euro-style game, it would be one where the players are all competing to be the best in some kind of ecosystem and that they work symbiotically together. That um, the merchant player sells stuff to the... Uh, uh, to the... Um, or, or, you know, the, 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 the craftsman player uh, sells his stuff to the merchant player. The merchant player then takes that stuff and sells it to the adventurer player. The adventurer player uh, uses that stuff to kill the monsters so that the craftsman player isn't killed. And everybody's working together, but everybody's competing to come out on top. That idea has been so attractive to me for so long. And I think, I don't know for a fact, I might be jumping the gun here. But I think, on some level, that's what Founders of Gloomhaven um, offers. Plus, remember I was talking earlier, feels like hours ago now, about City Council, which was a really cool city-building semi-cooperative game where everybody's on a member of a city council, and it's a semi-cooperative game where we all have to vote to decide how the city's going to advance. That's going to be in here. It actually sounds more like Lancaster, the laws, which uh, does the second run through I ever did was for Lancaster. We love the voting in Lancaster. It worked brilliantly with two. So anyway, long story short, I'm super excited for this. Obviously, it's my number five. I love fantasy, I love economic simulations, I love symbiosis between players in a competitive ecosystem, I love voting, um, you know, and, and all the drama that entails there, and, uh, well, like I said, because Gloomhaven itself is coming a little bit, is even higher on this list, I love Gloomhaven. So, all those things combined means, well, fingers crossed for my number five, Founders of Gloomhaven. And then, on to number four. Would you believe, another fantasy cooperative game! It's crazy, right? The Stygian Society. Here's why I'm excited about this. And it's such a bummer. There's really no art at all for this right now. But this is another one where I am just super duper stoked because of the promise of the core central gameplay mechanism of this game. This has a cube tower. Which is something that, um, let's see, somebody actually talked about it here. It was Zykendis Cruises, or something like that, we introduced the Coop Towers. But they were really made famous by Wallenstein and Shogun, where they were used for battle. You know, I've got my army, you've got your army, we uh, we're represented by these cubes, we drop them all in, whichever one comes out, that's how you resolve the, the clash between our armies. Never played those, never will, not interested. But... Jen, her top 10 of all time, I think in her top three maybe, is Amerigo, where Stefan Feld took the cube tower and turned it into a, the uh, central gameplay mechanism of uh, economic game of exploration. And it was absolutely brilliant. It was uh, action selection cubes instead of battle cubes. So we loved it. Absolutely adore it to death. Stigging Society is doing a cube tower game where, once again, players have their cubes. They're going to act. I mean, I believe the cubes represent actions the players are going to do. I think, because I put in a longer description down here. Uh, let's see. Whoever drops righty. In this cube tower, players put, select skills. Cubes that represent their skills to defeat enemies and drop cubes into the tower that match the selected player skill and enemy skills. Whatever drops out of the bottom, enemy and player cubes are used to battle out. Beware, though, if you... If, uh, what you drop in the top won't what comes out of the bottom. That's a cube tower. And cubes that land in the crypt count double. Whatever that means. I don't know. It's very vague. But here's the deal. 
I love Cube Towers. Jen loves Cube Towers even more. I love fantasy. I love cooperation. I think I love everything about this game. It's my number four, the Stygian Society. Okay, number three. Number three, another cooperative fantasy adventure. Yes, folks. Did I say it was crazy? It's crazy. I'm looking so forward to 2017 for gaming anyway. Uh, number three, The Legend of Andor, The Last Hope. Now here's the thing. This actually came out last year at Essen. This is actually officially a 2016 release, but it was only released auf Deutsch, only in German. And so it's not playable because these games have a ton of text and I am not interested in doing paste ups. But I'm hoping history repeats itself and Cosmo Thames or Thames Cosmos, Cosmos Thames, I forget which way they uh, will be bringing it out in English this year because this is the end of the Andor trilogy. I have played Andor to death. Jen and I right now are enjoying Andor Journey to the North and I'm going to want to finish it off in 2017 and see the trilogy through to the end with Andor The Last Hope. I haven't even bothered to look at what the gameplay is, what's new, what they've changed. I don't care. Andor is so amazingly good. I, I got to see it through to the end. So fingers crossed, we get it in Alf English in 2017. But I'll wait till 2018, whatever. But I'm, like I said, that's why it's number three on my list for fingers crossed 2017, Legend of Andor, The Last Hope. And now on to number two. One more time, folks. Fantasy Adventure. Hey, it's Gloomhaven. Did I say? What is that now? Okay, I, 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 let me see. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, uh, Seventh Continent is kind of fancy. We'll save seven. Seven, mm, eight, uh, near and far is but definitely a fantasy ish. Eight, nine, and win. Ten, kind of fantasy. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So, of my top 25, ten fantasy games. Most of them cooperative. Wow, I'm so excited. But anyway, I'm sorry. Let's get back to my number two, Gloomhaven. I did the run through for this. Um, it was at my number. It was my number one most anticipated game when I did this top 25 last year because it was supposed to come out last year. But it turned out to be too ambitious a project to get done because man, this crazy ambitious project is coming out in January, February. It's on the boats now, people. It's on its way. It's finally going to be here in this ridiculously obscene box. I saw it at Essen. The box is like this big. It's crazy. It's bigger than most. Um, it's bigger than. Ah, uh, maybe not. In my head, I remember it as being bigger than carry-on luggage for a plane. It may be not that big, but it's crazy big, yo. Um, and that's because it is so chock full of gaming goodness. What is it? It's a cooperative legacy fantasy game. Um, you know, Jen and I, best game we have ever played in our lives was Pandemic Legacy, in large part because of the notion of legacy, that the choices we make have permanent ongoing consequences that will never be undone um, across an epic campaign of sessions of gameplay. P I love, Pan love Pandemic Legacy? Very excited to have that same experience in a fantasy world. Because did I mention I like fantasy? So does Jen. She's a die-hard Tolkien fangirl. She's a die-hard Harry Potter, uh, Potter fangirl. We love fantasy. We love legacy. We love cooperative. And if all that wasn't enough, the core gameplay of Gloomhaven, again, you can watch my run-through to see more, is a skirmish battle system. And normally, I'll be honest, there are very, very few skirmish battle systems out there that Jen and I find even remotely palatable, but this one was so clever because it wasn't about dice. There are no dice. Uh, it's a diceless, it's a card-driven system where the cards you have in your hand all have, was it three different uses, and we all have to basically decide what cards we're going to play round around to try it out with the enemies. It was a brilliantly designed system. The legacy stuff, some of the stuff that's in here is so is, is so taking what Matt Leacock and Rob Davio did for Pandemic Legacy and building on it and pushing it in new directions, coming up with really cool new ideas. Can't wait for the final, but even still, it's my number two of the year. There's one that's even higher. What is it? Charterstone. Another legacy game. Although, we have ended our, um, our almost unbroken string of fantasy because this is, what did I say, a legacy-style game set in a Euro-style economic simulation. This is a city-building game. I don't know if we're all building one city, if we're all building our own little cities, but this is a game where, when I first heard of Legacy for Risk, my first thought was not Pandemic or not Fantasy Adventure, 
My first thought for the ideal legacy style game would be Agricola legacy. The notion of I have built this place, this functioning engine that does stuff, that produces things. Once the game is over, I don't want to throw that away. I want to continue to build upon it. Game after game after game, I want to make decisions in game two that I will feel the ramifications of in game 10. I want multi-generations to um, live and build and grow. And I want to go through it all with my wife, Jen. That's what Charterstone promises. It's like this game, I did say it, right? It's like this game was specifically designed for me and Jen. This could be the perfect game for us. Um, I'm very, very excited. Uh, I don't know anything about it. I haven't even bothered. It's a sight unseen game for me. It's my number one of the year, Charterstone. Phew, what are we at? Oh, uh, oh, that's right, I paused. I don't know how much long this has been. But anyway, folks, that's it. Although, that's not it. That was just my top 25. You'll notice I've got two additional pages here. Um, you know, pages two and three, because there are, uh, what is it? I totally forgot, I think there's like, Actually, wait a minute. I, I did actually. I put it down here at the bottom in the comments when I posted this geek list the other day. Let me expand the conversation. What did I say? So I've just talked about the top 25. What I'm going to be doing, not now because my throat is dying. I'm dying here, folks. But uh, shortly, you will be seeing my, uh, my next podcast, which you can always subscribe to my podcast, follow my podcast at podcast.rado.com. I am going to continue. I'm going to go through pages two and three of this list in my next podcast because there are, um, let's see, there's 57 games total on this list. I just talked about 25 of them. And so there's a bunch more to talk about. And then on top of that, there's a bunch of expansions to talk about as well. So if you want to hear about the rest of what's got me excited for, um, 2017, game-wise. Uh, there's a link for it right there. Um, again, podcast.rado.com. That'll be coming soon, and we'll, we'll hit the rest of this list. I was actually thinking, I don't know if I'll have time, because I have no idea how long the podcast is going to take to record, or how much I'll trash my voice doing it. But I also would like the idea of um, coming back to my 2016, because last year I did this top 25 for my 2016, and I'm kind of curious to go back and look at that video and do an update and say which of the 25 from last year actually worked out, because some of them worked out, some of them didn't. So maybe I'll do that in my next podcast as well. I don't know. But long story short, watch podcast http colon slash slash podcast.rado.com. Um, that'll be going up very, very soon where I talk about the rest of the games of 2017 of interest and that's it folks thanks for watching uh, if you have any questions comments concerns as always please let me know uh, again once again happy new year as i am planning on posting this on january 1st i hope 2017 is a great year for you i hope it's a great year for all of us and that's it folks thanks for watching talk to you later so long Bye bye